Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is our 12th webinar in the Think CX Digital Leaders Tell All series. A new school defines the culture of experimentation. If you have any questions, please ask in the chat area. If we don't have time to address live, we will certainly respond through email after the event. I am eager to introduce our panelists today. Digital marketing expert Amanda Simmons is the founder and CEO of Full Cup Creative. They are a data-driven creative and optimization agency located in Colorado. Amanda has been in creative design and marketing for nearly 20 years with a focus on conversion rate optimization for the past decade. Brian Kayak is the founding head of revenue CRO at Clearhead. He built Clearhead from four to 100 before being acquired by Accenture. He has spent over 25 years building teams, customer-centric companies, and helping humans achieve their highest potential at work. He is currently the senior digital growth executive inside Accenture Interactive. Michael Sharp is the CEO of Evolve Technologies. Evolve is an AI-driven solution for digital growth optimization that serves the best experience to each audience every time. He brings over two decades of digital commerce and retail experience with leadership roles at some of the most well-known retailers in North America, including Sears Canada, Toys R Us, Staples, and Best Buy. Welcome. Take it away, Michael. Thank you, Marin, and thank you, Amanda and Brian, for joining us today. And thanks for all of the participants joining on Bright Talk. I'm going to start with a few slides for background, and then we'll dive into the discussion with Amanda and Brian. Traditional experimentation models have been around for about 200 years now, and a core building block of these has been testing tools that include A-B and multivariate testing. The tools we're all familiar with have been around for a couple of decades now and have had very few major technological advances. Many companies have built teams and leverage experts, including agencies and systems integrators to help manage these programs with their internal teams. And they have focused heavily on conversions, but today's outcomes aren't meeting objectives. These companies are spending a ton of money on customer acquisition with a focus on social and paid search ads, but much of that traffic is not converting and companies are spending even more resources on more testing and creating hundreds of landing pages and hundreds of ads. Much of this is failing to drive growth, and in this case, better conversions. A number of big companies, however, have been very successful by focusing on building great customer experiences. Firms such as Amazon, Netflix, and Uber are just a few examples. They've done so by investing very significant resources to get there and building optimization into their core operating principles since their start. That level of investment is out of reach for most companies, but what isn't out of scope is the need to continually improve customer experience. It's not going away and it's critical to business success. Last October, Forrester put out their predictions for 2021. The title of the report is Digitally Advanced Firms Will Have a Sustained Advantage Over Their Competitors. They specifically focus on how customer experience is set to be one of the biggest driving forces behind business growth. And they specifically predict that 25% of brands will achieve statistically significant advances in CX quality in 2021. The report is really interesting and we'll post a copy of it here for you to access shortly. It's great to see many companies making the investment and in focusing on building great customer experiences but there is a lot of ground to cover and improvements to be made. And this is a continuous process that never ends. Optimization and customer experience are not stop-start projects. A key statistic that shows the struggle includes shopping cart abandonment, which has been increasing in 2020. While digital commerce was at a record high, the reality is that more potential revenue was lost than ever. Abandonment rates are currently running around 69% globally and even worse, 85% in mobile commerce. At Evolve, we focus on AI-driven optimizations and are getting Amazon and Netflix-like results for our clients. One notable example was highlighted in a recent webinar we did with Verizon's former head of optimization and personalization. In a period of 18 months, the optimization group grew their online sales 3.7 times, contributing significantly to Verizon's growth. This shows that the right customer experience can not only drive growth, 
but can be a competitive differentiator, which also impacts key metrics like average order value, customer lifetime value, and others such as customer satisfaction and loyalty scores. So let's dive in and have our discussion with Brian and Amanda now. Hi guys. Hello. Great. So Brian, let's start with you. So in 2021, how does optimization and experimentation need to change to drive success and specifically growth for the clients you're seeing? Yeah, thanks for having us, Michael. This is a great con conversation to have. So, you know, one of the things we see within Accenture's client base, I mean, you know, Accenture primarily serves the Fortune 500, so a lot of the, the bigger clients. And, you know, when you saw the last year was a significant uh, shift in uh, growth to the digital channel and also just a real uh, trying to understand what consumer habits would be as so many different habits formed just due to COVID, but also some other things just went away. And so the two of those things really end up driving a lot of interest in how do we better keep pulse of what the consumers want so we can more quickly shift our roadmaps if it's a marketing or experience or other uh, roadmaps to respond to the customer's needs. And so, you know, to me, what I think is really interesting, and Amanda and I were talking about this uh, before this is, you know, number one is embracing additional technologies for those different touch points. Like it's a long time coming. So is like, for example, like the AI power technologies you all provide, but to enable certain parts of the experience to drive much more value. The second part, you know, is just the I see is really the need for more real time insights because, you know, customer needs are only going to continue to shift. And so how do you really keep much have more tactics that you can employ to keep real time pulse of what is happening with customer behaviors and quickly digest that and use that in your what I call like activation roadmaps. Um, and the other thing is really kind of thinking about a holistic approach, like, you know, about the, about the experience beyond maybe where people have focused historically on a, on a conversion part of the funnel, but, you know, customers think about it much more broadly of all the, all the interaction points. So how do you help espouse a really a holistic approach to customer experience and using these tactics to like help validate along the way it requires a broader thinking than maybe how people entered this just a year ago. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, we try to think about the entire customer journey as we work with our clients and what yeah. are the touch points that engage them and all the way through. And, and obviously, you know, as customers have seen lots of new ways of engaging because of COVID, uh, you know, the, the uh, ability to deliver great experiences across web, across mobile, across in-store pickup, delivery, you know, and all kinds of new methods are really, really critical. Mm -hmm. uh, Amanda, what are some of the things you have seen? This I, I have seen just a massive adoption of moving to everything digital and businesses having to pivot on that dime of now we need curbside overnight. And I think that really where companies are going to be successful is adopting a growth mindset through this period and optimization overall. And I agree with Brian on the AI tool, allowing more scale and velocity for people to get through experimentation um, in wider parts of their business are really going to allow those quick pivots that we need to do in the landscape. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, one of the things that I think has been tr true for a long time in, in commerce is that there's never been a lack of data. What we've had is a lack of tools that actually can help us action that data and make decisions for us in a way that actually really starts to achieve our business goals. Mm -hmm. um, there's always been a huge amount of customer data that we've had. It's just been really difficult to translate that into business value. And hopefully we're getting to that point now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Amanda, yeah. how important is it to get companies to think holistically about their experimentation programs and what are some of the components that they need to think about? I really think it's supremely important to think about your program holistically. You know, you guys just mentioned in the previous question, customers have more choices than ever. They have more touch points than ever. We have to create consistency and build that trust with them. And if we are only looking at one portion of the business to optimize, we could be disrupting another portion of the business and not even knowing how that's affecting the customer journey. So really being holistic is very important, even if you can't get testing out through all channels of the organization, sharing those learnings and making sure that you are educating um, your own company with what the possibilities are. And also it's what the customers value. It's not just that the bottom line uh, for the business is being met, it's that the customer's needs are being met and it's balancing those two. So it's not just holistically and getting an omni-channel approach out there, which is what is needed, but it's also balancing really what the customer's value and need and improving that performance or bottom line on your side. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Go ahead, right. yeah, I was just gonna ask you what, what you'd like to say. <laughs> I, you know, we find often this kind of notion and you, what's been a really neat evolution is that, 
you know, it's not just about measuring the the financial performance, you know, and the traditional metrics you might use, but really thinking about what's the customer's value in that moment. And so, you know, you think about across the journey, as Michael, you were saying, and Amanda, you were building on is, you know, if we're thinking about the broad customer journey, then how do we think about those moments where there's a really customer value, where we're there, like, this is something that really needs to perform for me. And how do you get a sense for that? And really, as you think about this holistic um, journey, really start thinking about those, the metrics you're using to measure from their standpoint, which might not be conversion rate. They don't care if they converted, right? So it's, um, it's thinking about that too and blending the two. Yeah, and I think that's where things like customer satisfaction and engagement and you know frequency visits, there's a whole bunch of metrics that are really important as a secondary set of data to look at to understand how your experience might impact future, future transactions and future customer purchases. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so carrying on with that theme, Brian, you know, how can companies balance all the competing forces that they're dealing with when they try to look at these programs? You know, there's obviously time, budget, risk, potential reward, complexities of organizational structures and ownership. And, you know, it's it's a really meaty topic. Would love just, you know, a little bit of high, 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 high level thoughts on that one. Yeah, super easy, really. And we, <laughs> yeah. And there's no uh, answer for sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so here's my kind of, I think about like, what are the kind of tips you could use to help maybe navigate this? Cause it is difficult and it can be very complex and all the things is, you know, number one, like is how do you really start with the end in mind? I feel like too often what happens is um, people start, uh, especially practitioners will start with a, they have a tactic. So I, I you know, I do a manual AB test. So it's like every hammer is looking for a nail then versus really thinking about what's the business outcome I'm trying to enable. And it could be in a particular uh, case, a you know, customer experience metric you're trying to influence or there a financial metric, or even sometimes there's operational metrics around throughput or quality. So if, if you think about number one, like what's the outcome you're trying to generate and then the significance of it. So if you're trying to launch something that's a big, bold new project, then there's obviously going to be more time involved more budget, but then there's gonna be a lower risk appetite, right? But if it's something, and then in those cases, there's certain tactics, if you start with that end in mind, there's certain tactics that are better designed to help you find that, um, get there, right? If you're gonna get that outcome. But then other cases where there's things that are much more rapidly iterative and things happening consistently, then there is, a, you can use, you don't have to use those same big tactics that might take weeks to build and weeks for insights to unfold. And then you get much more rapid insights in a lightweight way. And so to me, this part of this evolution of like thinking about that outcome in mind and the risk and time that you have available, and then having it kind of pushes you to have a broader suite of tools and tactics that you were saying, Michael, uh, at your fingertips, so you can um, be more effective in more circumstances and be driving value in more circumstances. So that's really end in mind and then match the tactic based on what's the reward and the risk and the, the, that you're willing to throttle. And then as people learn that, it'll become more about how the organizational does these things and it's not so foreign, it becomes part of the nomenclature. And do you guys, do you see big differences in terms of uh, how companies address these challenges? Does it vary a lot by industry or size or are there you know, common challenges that you know, kind of live across all types of organizations that people try to overcome? Yeah, I, you know, uh, one of the things Amanda and I were talking about before is this kind of notion of, you know, organizational silos can be like the biggest hindrance to success. And I really think the, I would say the thing I see the most is, um, is around like just the maturity and the, the, how much that these things are embraced, like digital maturity. And I kind of got a real jolt over the last 12 months. But the ones that are, you know, just kind of, you know, treating digital still as a channel, then these things tend to be more nascent where it's not well understood. There's a business case for every kind of move, you know, processes are not well refined versus if you get to the ones that are more mature digitally and really think in a data driven customer centric mindset, you'll find there's fewer silos. And then there's a lot more fluidity about like organizing around specific outcomes and the vernacular is much more common. So I think to me, at least what I see in, in the customers I get to serve is there's a, a broader continuum, but it's really a bit dependent on their digital maturity and how much they've learned these things along the way. Yeah, yeah, I think the last year has been interesting. I think it really exposed the differences in terms of how enterprises have really thought about digital. Uh, you know, there were clearly, you know, companies like Best Buy, Verizon, Amazon, Walmart, who looked at uh, the opportunity and really doubled down on their digital initiatives very early on and pivoted to take advantage of the window of opportunity. And then a number of companies, 
you know, in fact, the majority really kind of hit pause for a little bit to try to figure out what was going to happen. And now they're scrambling to really try to reinvest. But I think what's become clear to everybody is that the importance of the digital channels uh, is really significant. And the behavioral changes that we've seen in the last year for online shopping, for online banking, travel, you know, media consumption, those behaviors are not going to revert to pre-COVID norms. Right. You, see, you know, some industries like restaurants and movie theaters obviously rebound. But I think for almost all customer transactions, everybody now is pretty comfortable in the uh, digital space. And, you know, brands are going to have to get really good at creating and serving experiences that meet customer expectations. Right. You know, something you certainly see now is after that, you know, a fast growth year. And, you know, eMarketer publishes is one example, tons, tons of statistics about a year on your revenue growth in e-commerce, as an example, you know, 40, 50, 120 percent year over year growth. And so now what I certainly see in the first part of this calendar year is companies wrestling with, like, how do I replicate that? and experience being very much a C-suite agenda. And then that's trickling back through the technologies that are used is trickling back through organizational alignment. And how do we organize around the fact that now our you know, consumer business or direct consumer business is 40, 50% of the business where it was maybe 15% a year ago. And so you see a lot of that significant disruption is having all the right, very positive, I think, enhancement and driving digital maturity quicker. Yeah, it also has pretty significant implications for omnichannel retailers and all of the capital investments they've made in uh, stores and distribution centers and delivery mechanisms. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so Amanda, what are you seeing with some of your clients along these ways? You know, how are uh, how are your clients approaching some of these challenges? I can tell you, I'm never going back to the grocery store if I don't have to, and I can do cards. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Uh, I'm buying fresh produce in the stores. The, the yeah. <laughs> But we've talked about Target before and we've talked about Best Buys. I, you know, I have been admiring uh, these companies that you've talked about early adopters that have just jumped on this, not afraid of risk, just to get out there and serve their customers and allowing that them to learn and pivot where they need to. And for our customers, a lot of our customers have call centers. We saw those really affected by not being able to be physical and then being forced to the digital experience in order for the business to continue. So really having to shove a lot of experience into a short amount of time last year is what I saw, but the adoption of the technology and the adoption of experimentation is more open than I've ever seen it with our customers. And I think that Brian hit on a good point with digital maturity. Um, all of our clients and customers with different levels of acumen within their organizations and it's finding a piece to help them start to bolt these ideas on together for broader impact. Um, but I see our companies are more open, but more money, time, and effort have gone into digital across the board. Yeah, I yeah. agree. So, Amanda, so when you engage with a client, how do you get started? How do you, you know, walk into an enterprise who's, you know, ready to take take the leap down this path? And, you know, what are some of the first things you look for and what are some of the first things you work on? Well, you know, Brian and I, again, we were talking before and he used a word I really like and I'm going to add to it. But he was talking about finding someone within the organization that's a disruptor. Um, we see ourselves as change agents. So I think finding somebody like minded that you can go in and partner with is supremely important for getting started. And then having leadership buy in, obviously is huge and we were talking earlier it, you know we tend to want to get you on more of a broader roadmap looking down the road integrating channels but really what can we do in the first 30 60 90 days that supports an initiative that they have going on internally or a project or the metric that brian was talking about before to really start to get the momentum of that success and then start to breed it ours mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and how about you brian yeah, even to build on that, you know, so we talk about this persona of the disruptor, you know, for the, I think the practitioners in the audience, and maybe you are that disruptor, and you want to be, you know, you want to carry the, the torch and, and help be that change agent, then I think it's about how do you find a project where there's an outcome that an executive cares about, and they want to sponsor it, because you are in fact driving outcomes that they care about. And, and because of that, they might also consider doing something in a different way than maybe the way it's always been done. I find too often things are run as like projects and budgets with timelines, not as something that's generating an outcome. So I think the practitioners that want to kind of elevate that message to something more outcome centric gives them a much better shot of gaining that sponsorship 
Um, and so I think that's kind of an advice for like a practitioner mindset and then a practitioner, but someone who's an executive out there who's like listening is like, yeah, I really know we need to do more of this. Then I think that's a similar kind of approach is what is on your list of priorities that you've been given for the year that you know you need to nail. And, you know, it's like you don't want to just treat it like a project or a budget, but you really want to drive that outcome. Well, then how do you start pulling in some of these these tactics and technologies and capabilities to really think about it maybe differently and seeing if you can kind of iterate your way to that successful outcome. So, and then find those disruptors that are trying to carry the torch and pull them along with you, you know? So yeah, those are great points. You know, when I, I spent most of my career in retail and, you know, was a bit of a, a disruptor and change agent. And I found that, you know, when I came over to this side of the table, it was super important to find those partners who are willing to do whatever it took to be successful. Uh, it can be really hard in a large enterprise, even for people who've been there a long time to know how and where to get things done. And, you know, finding a good partner to help succeed who's got the same objectives is really critical. And, you know, one of the things we've imp implemented at Evolve, and we really focus all of our efforts around trying to find, you know, KPIs that we can impact immediately and try to drive business value to really get started. Because we think that the quickest way to get people engaged is to show outcomes yeah. and you know, find ways you can improve business results, you know, in, in near real time. And, uh, you know, if you could do that, it's a lot easier to get more and more people enthusiastic and engaged about trying to, to march down this path about building great experiences and thinking about the outcomes. Yeah. Much on the specific tools and things. Yeah, especially, I mean, I find, you know, every big companies and everybody's, you know, just swamped. You hear a lot of, you know, stories about burnout now. People are living, you know, 30 minutes, 30 minutes on their calendars. And so the more you can show them a reason to start shifting so that way, they just, it, you know, it's an easy button to do it, to do it better. They can get a better outcome. Then they'll be willing to start making shifts in their calendar. As I totally agree with that outcome centric. And like, if you do that and help have less energy to do that, well, then people are listen, you know? Yeah. I don't think we can use the easy button. I think it's trademark, but uh, we try to, we try to make it easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll use it. <laughs> yeah, you could use it. Yeah, uh, I did spend a couple of years at Staples. It was a great branding campaign. Yeah. Um, so, how about failure and experimentation? You know, there. You know, in the past, there have been companies that have kind of touted this uh, kind of mindset that losing is the new winning. You know, we actually think losing is the same as it's always been. It's losing, and you know, how how do you think about you know focusing on minimizing you know losses and achieving real time you know, outcomes and, you know, making sure you don't need to have large numbers of failures to get to get outcomes that are beneficial. You know, we think that's a, a old mindset. Well, I think it asks how, how are we defining failure? Is, yeah. is failure an individual test? And of course you can lose the test. You need to lose tests. You have to lose to learn. But really the failure is not at sharing those learnings and getting them out through the organization or for failing over and over and over again on tests just shows misalignment with programs. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways we can define failure, but I do think you're not going to be hundred percent successful. If you are, you need to strive for bigger ideas and initiatives. Um, and if you are failing all the time, you need to look at your program and see where the misalignments are um, in either the goals or the expectations um, or your properties that you are working with. But another part of failure is not optimizing, is not improving, is not getting out there to make the change. And I think I see that so often. You mentioned the early adopters earlier and then some people that have just paused. And those people that are paused, in my opinion, are they're just they are failing at continuing to improve their business because they're not putting the, the risk is so small compared to the reward. So I think there's different ways of failure and absolutely you're going to fail, but it's either use that learning to uh, improve your next hypotheses and get it better and more on target in iteration um, and fuel the program with it. Yeah, I, I love that point. You know, the biggest failure is actually not trying and not constantly working at improving your customer experience. I think that's the biggest risk to any business is, is trying to stay static or not being aggressive. Yeah, and another thing I think that we need to watch is making sure that we stay in a growth mindset for experimentation and really looking outward and really being, you guys have both used it several times this talk, being experience focused, experience obsessed for our users and our customers so we can help align those things. It, it, the growth mindset is really important to can keep the momentum up um, when you do fail. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so Brian, maybe you could talk a little bit about how do you guys see AI? Is it is it um, something that you guys are scared of? Does it have risk to the services you provide? Is it an enabling tool? You know, does it take away from people? I know you know there's been a lot of talk mm -hmm. about 
you know, machines and AI taking jobs and, and, you know, taking over the world. We certainly don't see it that way, but I'd love to hear your perspectives on yeah, where yeah. it fits in. It's all Skynet, right? We're just going to hit the button and it all goes away. Uh, now, you know, so it's, it's a really, you know, you think about these transformational technologies that have come along in these movements throughout history. And you certainly see the AI is one of those movements right now. And from our standpoint, you know, again, when you think about this concept of end to end holistic view of customer service or customer experience, and not only just with the digital properties, but across co contact centers, et cetera, you really see the, the power of AI coming to life in all those different areas. And so what Accenture really does, not only po partners with technologies that are doing something amazing, but also builds a lot of uh, internal assets that we use that we call enablers or accelerators in order to um, accelerate the services. Because the end of the day, the idea is to accelerate the outcome for the client. And yeah. so not it's, you know, services, yes, is a, is a means to that end, but it's about accelerating that outcome for the client and doing so in a very operationally efficient way. And so what's really exciting to see in the last couple of years is not AI for AI's sake, you know, like in a first wave, but like yeah. really very point solutions coming out that'll drive significant value, help make any of the, you know, the, the humans doing the work insights quicker, they can drive, uh, realize outcomes quicker, more, more proactive notifications around that and drive actions quicker. The more you can you know, shorten that cycle, um, the, the greater the speed the value is. And so, so it's very much a core to a lot of the technology strategy you see Accenture talk about amongst cloud and other things, um, but really in the spirit of like shortening that cycle to outcomes. So it's very much not, not Skynet, there's not a fear of it. It's an embrace, it's really an enabler to driving outcomes. Yeah, that's great. And, and Amanda, can you maybe share an interesting use case on something you guys have worked on recently around optimization and you know where you've where you've uh, really helped the client? Yeah, I, I can. I, I was just thinking about where to use that with AI. Yeah. You know, it's not an immediate one, but it's something that comes back in the design experience. I think it's relevant. Is so many clients this time of year want a new brand and they get a new website. They've been working on it with the brand team and, and want to launch that. And we've really been able to help clients find the right combination of those new assets and really find the right uh, by different channels by using AI to fill out, is it the homepage, is it the landing page? So AI has allowed us to scale in depth and those answers that have not been so clear in the past when you do things like a redesign when the client is bent, or we are going to make this switch, helping them understand the impact and peel that back and then apply it to all parts of the business with quantifiable you know, results around these different designs and elements. So I really, for me as a design focused company, the redesign aspect and the depth that that goes to for them to understand the impact is really important to us and has helped businesses grow. Yeah, and that, that's been our experience too. I think once we overcome the fear of AI, uh, what people have found is that it really helps them do their job better by providing them a lot more resources, a lot more data. And you know, in many cases, uh, the ability to try things they would have never thought of, either because of limitations of scale um, or just combinations of ideas that don't seem intuitive, but you know, from a customer perspective, end up working really well. Yeah, same, see the same thing for sure. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Uh, balance between uh, investing in tools, partners, and internal teams. You know, where do you see companies, uh, you know, placing their bets, and what do you think are the most important areas to start? And Brian, why don't you take that first? Okay, sure. Yeah, what, so um, sound, not to sound too consulting -y, but it's true, uh, is it, it really does depend. So I see today, still there's, um, I see there's a lot of investment, especially in this area in technologies because there are gaps and there are known uh, outcomes that can be generated. So when there's a combination of, I know there's value there and I know it takes technology to drive it, then you see the quick investment of it. Um, and so that, especially in this kind of area, I see quite a bit of investment in technology. In other circumstances, maybe it's, you know, there's, that's not the quick fix. They need to take what they have and actually, you know, make use of it and get use of it um, before you advance the technology agenda. Uh, but as, um, in a lot of areas like this that we, you know, we always train clients to think about well, what's the customer value, what's the business value you can generate, and then how does data and technology need to enable that better at the right cost to serve. And so it's like aligning that equation to make sure it's for that circumstance, it's best aligned. But and so and there's always a little bit of a different variance, but I see a lot in the marketing technology space, there's still a bias to buy the technology because they know there's a lot of gaps to serve. Yeah, Amanda, anything to add there? 
I would just say I completely agree, uh, but there has been a significant investment in technology and teams I've seen across our clients and in the industry. And what I really am happy to start seeing is there's a lot of silo technology through different channels and tools like Evolve allow us to jump those property lines and, and optimize in a holistic way that can allow less tech that serves more. And that has been helpful to our clients. Yeah, we certainly view both as being really critical. We think the ability to, to know how to implement these tools and think differently about optimization, leveraging the power of AI and machine learning, you know, is not just a technology play. It's really something that requires some skill set and some partners to help companies be successful. So uh, with that, I think we are right at 1030. So uh, thank you both for joining. It was a great conversation. Uh, thanks for everybody for attending. Uh, we'll also share out, um, you know, the presentation from today and the reports referenced and uh, the three of us would be happy to engage with any of you. Thanks. Thank you, Michael, for your time. Yeah, thank you. This is great.